Good evening. Welcome to worship at Bethel Christian Reformed Church this evening, though I, uh, as a guest here, it seems odd that I'm welcoming you, but it is great to see each and every one of you here this evening, and it's a delight to be with you in worship once again. Join me in prayer as we ask the Lord to bless our time together and guide us in worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for the grace with which you bestow your favor upon us each and every day. We pray for the many ways that you have guided us and cared for us this week. And we pray that as we worship you this Sunday evening, that you would glorify your name through us, that you would guide us into your truth, and that you would give us wisdom so that we might serve you better. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. This evening, our Lord calls us to worship using the words of Psalm 20. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. We will shout for joy when you are victorious and will lift up our banners in the name of our Lord. May the Lord grant all of your requests. We begin our worship together tonight with the words of the hymns from Psalter Hymnal number 8, Lord, our Lord, your glorious name, and glorious things of these are spoken.
people of God, receive the Lord's greeting tonight. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen. Take a few moments to greet your brothers and sisters in Christ this Sunday evening. You may be seated. Psalm 77, a prayer of Asaph, is a psalm filled with raw emotion and despair. Asaph's despair so consumes him that it causes him to experience sleepless nights punctuated with honest questions of doubt. I'm sure that there are many of us here tonight who can say we've struggled with similar times in our lives. As I've meditated on Psalm 77 this past week, there were two themes that spoke to me. Like Asaph, when we keep our focus on praising our great God and his faithfulness, our anxious thoughts have a much harder time taking hold. Also, this psalm reminds me of one of the many reasons why singing as a congregation, like we just did, is so important. Simply put, it helps us to remember, as Asaph did, singing is an incredible mnemonic device that enables our brains to learn God's word and to retain it. And so we come to this place as many different people who have different life experiences and stories, but we commune as one body to worship and to remember. It is in that light that we begin our reading of Psalm 77. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands and my soul refused to be comforted. I remembered you, O God, and I groaned. I mused, and my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart mused, and my spirit inquired, Will the Lord reject us forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Then I thought, to this I will appeal, the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. Your ways, O oh God, are holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, O oh God. The waters saw you and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The skies resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. Your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. We pray together. Covenant God, when anguish fills our day, and doubts keep us awake through the night. Help us to remember your faithfulness shown in your mighty acts of ages past, trusting your present power and constant love revealed in Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's now sing and remember together the faithfulness of our saving Lord. He will indeed hold us fast. will hold me fast when the tempter would prevail he will hold me fast I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path for my love is often cold he must hold me fast Oh, 
hold me fast, precious in His holy sight. He will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. Bought by Him at such a cost, He will hold me fast. Satisfied, he will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life, he will hold me fast till our faith is turned to sight. When he comes at last, he will hold. Please join me this evening in a prayer for right hearing as we open God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening that you have graced us with. We thank you for the opportunity to worship. We thank you for your love that always holds us fast, that extends beyond our sin, beyond our rebellion, beyond the hardness of our hearts to soften the soil of our hearts so that your grace can do its work. We pray that you'll make us mindful of how much you love us and how much you love all of those that we encounter as well. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading tonight is going to come from Matthew's gospel. And it is a story that's quite familiar to you. Probably one of Jesus' most famous parables. Matthew chapter 24. We're going to start reading at verse 31 of that chapter this evening. Matthew chapter 24. Excuse me. Matthew chapter 25. That might help you a little bit. Matthew chapter 25. And we're going to start reading in verse 31. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. 
Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. This parable comes at the end of a sequence of parables that Jesus has been telling, starting in chapter 24 and extending until the end of chapter 25. And if you'll recall, chapter 24 begins with that famous scene where Jesus and his disciples are leaving the temple. And the disciples are completely overwhelmed with the grandeur and the size of the temple. If you ever see a scaled model of Herod's temple, it is a breathtaking sight. Herod spared no expense because uh, reconstructing the temple was a way to try to appeal to the people of Judea to support his reign. And so the complex is awe-inspiring. The disciples were looking at it, marveling at one of the great structures of their day, and they spoke to Jesus and said, look at this, look what a great, glorious temple this is. And Jesus says, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. His disciples come to him later and they ask him, what will be the sign of these things and of the time of your coming? And it's very important to note that there are two things they're asking. One, what will be the sign of these things you're speaking of? And what will be the sign of your coming or of the coming of the Son of Man? Now, I don't know if they realized they were asking two different things. But as Jesus begins to unfold the narrative in Matthew 24, he tells them about two different things. First of all, he does refer to the coming time when the temple will be torn to pieces. Not one stone will be left on another. And that time is coming much sooner than they think. When Jesus makes that reference, they think, well, this must be a portent of the apocalypse because they can't imagine a world without the temple. This is the absolute desecration of the site of worship dedicated to God's holy name. In their minds, if it's gone, then the very fabric of society itself must have been overturned. The apocalypse itself must be upon them. The reality is in only about 40 years after Jesus' crucifixion, the Romans are going to come in and utterly devastate the temple. And so Jesus makes some references directed towards that coming event, an event that is much sooner than they can anticipate. But he goes further than that and he also gives them the rest of their question or the rest of the answer they are seeking. He also refers to some signs that will prefigure his own second coming. And these signs, they have a hard time understanding because obviously he is still with them. They've not even realized the full implications of his first coming. So what he gives them in terms of understanding regarding his second coming is something they find very hard to understand. Even after he explains it to them, there's still quite a bit of confusion on their part. And as an expansion of this conversation, Jesus starts to tell them a series of parables. There are five in all, each of which are geared to explain the nature of his kingdom. And not just the kingdom that will be inaugurated at his second coming, but the kingdom which is already being inaugurated amongst them. His second coming will be the culmination of a kingdom that has already begun to be born in their hearts and continues to be born in our hearts. The kingdom begins to be realized by the way that his people live on earth. And it will be fully realized at his second coming. And so in these parables, he seeks to help them understand the nature of the great kingdom that he has come to inaugurate. And in a way, that's connected with their question about the temple because they are so overawed about the size and the complexity of this structure. And he is trying to impress upon them that this earthly temple built with human treasure and human effort doesn't even begin to compare with the eternal kingdom that will be 
being born in the hearts of the church, being brought into the world through their actions and through their words, and ultimately realized in his second coming. The last of those parables is the one that we're going to look at tonight. And in many ways, it may be the most famous of them. Definitely, it's one that has provided rich imagery for artists, for literary uh, composers, and for musical composers throughout the history of the Christian church. And the image that Jesus gives us here is one that was very familiar to most of his disciples. And probably one that will be more familiar to those of us living in Sioux County than it would be to most Christians throughout the world, especially most Christians in the United States. Uh, Here in Sioux County, we live closer to the earth than most Americans do. That's probably a safe assumption. He talks about how farmers during that day would put their animals up at night. Though it could be warm sometimes during the day in that part of the world, it gets very cold at night. When the sun goes down, it could be freezing, especially during the winter months of the year. And so a good shepherd will leave both his sheep and his goats out to graze. And while they're grazing, he'll usually allow them to remain together. But at the end of the day, when night comes, he summons them and he begins to separate them. He'll put the sheep in one area and the goats in another area. And the reason he does this is because the sheep have more protection against the elements. They're woolly, as you've probably observed, and they therefore have a little bit extra insulation, at least until that insulation is taken from them a little bit later by those who decide to harvest that wool. The goats are short-haired creatures, and they're a little bit more susceptible to the elements, and so they'll be put in a different structure. The shepherd is very intentional about sending the sheep in one direction and the goats in the other. Now, you may see me get my lefts and my rights mixed up because I'm left-handed and it saddens me the terrible prejudice that my people have endured throughout the centuries. It's just awful. Uh, The left hand is always looked down on for whatever reason. And the Bible, uh, following that trend, of course, always talks about the right hand as the place of honor because it always does. We've endured many things from having to use special scissors to trying to figure out which side of a baseball diamond to stand on so you know it's it's tough but we make it we persevere and of course the sheep are going to go to the right because that's the place of honor and the goats are going to go to the left because well it's not so much the place of honor in most cultures throughout human history as the shepherd is doing this in the parable Jesus now extends the metaphor, he extends the illustration, and he takes us to the end of days. And at the end of days, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ himself, is standing there. He is a part of the judgment that God is now unfolding upon the human race at the end of days. And as he separates the sheep and the goats, he comments on the way they have treated those who are his, those who he has loved. And he says to the sheep who go to the right, you have honored me by loving those who represent me on earth. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked and needing clothing, you clothed me. And so on and so forth. And the righteous are astonished. They say, but Lord, when did we do these things? When did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? When did we see you needing clothing? When did we see you in prison? And Jesus responds, when you did these things to one of the least of these whom I love, you did it to me. One of the first things that jumps out about this story and about our identity as his sheep is the fact that love and mercy are an extension of their, for lack of a better term, sheepiness. These are the kind of words that only philosophers are allowed to say. Philosophers get to make up words all the time. So we'll engage a little bit of that tonight. This is a function of their sheepiness. They love because they are sheep. They are persons who have been transformed by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Their hearts, their souls, their spirits have been touched by his grace to such a degree that their default setting is love and compassion. How do we know that? Because when Jesus says to them, you have done this to me and you have done that to me, they seem quite astonished at that. And yes, it is true that he is sort of enfolded in the clothing 
of other people they've helped out. So their question is to some degree conditioned by the fact that when they were helping others, they weren't aware that they were helping Jesus by helping others. But also, they just help others. This is what they do. They've never thought in their ministry to others, well, I'm extending a hand to Jesus as I'm extending a hand to this one who is suffering. This is simply what they do because they are sheep. There's a great story that came from one of the churches that I was privileged to serve in several years ago about this guy who for years and years had perfect attendance at church. And when I say years, I'm talking about decades. And they had this program that they did in that church all of those decades since he was a young boy where they put these stars up for attendance. And he loved to boast about the fact that, hey, I've had more stars than anyone else did. I've had perfect attendance all these years. I've been here serving, never once thought about letting anything prevent me from being in the Lord's house on Sunday morning. Well, there came a point where a new pastor came and he preached a little bit. And then he preached and got to meddling in his preaching. And then he got to changing a few things. And one of the things he decided to change was this custom of putting a star up for attendance. He thought, you know, that's, that's a little bit petty, kind of subpar. I mean, do we really need to have the board up showing who's been here and who hasn't been here? And so they end up doing away with the board. The guy who had attended for so many years perfectly, his attendance became somewhat sporadic after that. And the question was raised, was it because of his devotion to be in the Lord's house on Sunday morning, or was it because he had this trinket, this token of his obedience? The sheep in this story are not looking for the commendation, but they receive it nonetheless because of who they are. Not because of the brownie points or the merit badges they were trying to pile up. They're compassionate because they are Christ. And those whose hearts belong to Christ are people who act as Christ acts. They are people of love and compassion. May it never be said of God's people that we are cruel. May it not be said of God's people that we are arrogant. May it not be said of God's people that we neglect those who are in need. This should be antithetical. To who we are. It should be completely contradictory to our identity in Christ. Because we are sheep, this is how we act. This is what we do. Here also we see the fact that that compassion and that mercy extends by God's grace to all people. There are no exceptions. Jesus says to the righteous who are on his right hand, what you have done even to the very least of these whom I love, you have done it to me as well. The word all means all. And the word least in every language means lowest, very bottom. You can't go lower in other words. We're often so intimidated by worldly status, by wealth, by prestige, by the passing things of this world. Jesus says what you do to the very least of these who belong to me, who I love, you have done it to me as well. Who belongs to him? Who does he own? Well, certainly the church belongs to him. Certainly those who place their faith in Christ are his by virtue of salvation. But we also believe that God has created all of humanity, whether we all recognize it or not. Paul discusses this in the first chapter of the book of Romans. He says, whether everyone acknowledges it or not, God is God of everyone. He is God of all creation. There will be those who by his grace acknowledge it and find salvation in Christ. But even those who don't acknowledge his lordship live under it. Even those who don't, who don't acknowledge the fact that he created them, they are his creation. There is a worth that human beings have by virtue of the fact that we are God's creation. Every person you encounter, Christian and non-Christian, white, black, Asian, Caucasian, no matter what they are, they are people that have value and worth simply because they are God's own unique special creation. He loves them. Whether they return that love or not, his love burns for them. We call this in the Kuyperian tradition, common grace. 
The idea that God has extended a measure of his grace to all of creation, whether all of creation recognizes that or not. Certainly in the church, as his children, born of his grace, born of the blood of Jesus Christ, we recognize his love and compassion extended towards all of us and prayerfully extending through all of us to the rest of the world as well. He leaves no one out here. There is a sad and very disturbing spirit that is rampant in our culture today. And no single person or group has got a monopoly on it. It is a spirit that demeans. It is a spirit that devalues. It is a spirit that looks down on. A spirit that is arrogant, that wants to raise itself up by pushing others down. This is the very antithesis of everything the gospel of Jesus Christ is about. There's a great song that came out a few years ago that was covered actually by several Christian artists. Uh, the version of it I'm most familiar with was, was covered by Sandy Patty. It's called In Heaven's Eyes. And it's got some great lyrics. In heaven's eyes, there are no losers. In heaven's eyes, there is no hopeless cause. Just people like you with feelings like me, amazed by the grace that we can find in heaven's eyes. Jesus certainly would have approved of the direction of that lyric, and he endorses it with this parable in which he says, what you do even to the least of these matters to me because even the person that is considered to be the lowest on this earth is valued, prized, and loved in my eyes. The opposite of that, of course, we see towards the end of the parable where he also confronts those who are represented as the goats because of the negative ways that they have treated other people. The way that we treat others matters both in time and in eternity. We've seen that the sheep treat people with compassion because the sheep, well, they're sheep. It's part of their sheepiness. We've also seen that even the least of human beings are precious and important to Jesus. And we see here as he confronts those who, uh, in whatever ways, have refused to extend his love to others, that it matters how we relate to others, not only for now, but for eternity as well. And there is going to be an accounting for the perspective we have towards others and the way that we treat others as well. In speaking to those who are represented as the goats, those who are called the unrighteous, uh, Jesus says to them, you are going into eternal punishment and you're going in that direction because you didn't feed me when I was hungry. You didn't give me water when I was thirsty. You didn't visit me when I was in prison. Now, if we look at this, this can be difficult to wrestle with because it almost looks like these people are being punished because of their works and others are being rewarded for their works. And that does cut against the grain of the theology that we know from reading the other parts of the gospel. But if you look closely... What is different is the sheep are sheep. They have been saved by grace, and this is why they do what they do. This is part of their identity. The goats are goats because they have not experienced that touch of grace. They have not had that confrontation with the living Christ. And they're not watering, feeding, visiting, caring for. It's something that stems from their nature as well. Now, it would be foolish for us to say that those who don't know Christ don't know compassion. There are a lot of people in this world that act in very compassionate ways who are not Christians. And in the same vein, it would be foolish for us to think that Christians always act in compassionate ways. There are people who are not Christians that put Christians to shame sometimes by the way they act as compared to the way that Christians act ethically. But as a general rule, as a theological principle, those who are in Christ should be characterized by a different way of acting. And though those who don't know Christ may act with compassion at times, the real test of that is going to be when circumstances are adverse, when people act in ways in which they don't deserve compassion. Does the compassion continue to extend to them then? And... Grace should make a difference in that regard. Our compassion, our love should be unwavering. It should be unconditional as our Lord's love is unconditional. And so the behaviors here are flowing out of the identities of the sheep and of the goats. 
And what you're seeing here is the goats acting in a very goaty way. Not knowing that unconditional love, they're not acting in that way either. And they're acting in ways rather that are cruel, that are demeaning to others, that are putting down those who Christ would have us lift up. And Jesus goes through and he indicates each of these different groups. And he says, when you did these negative things to them, then you did them to me as well. That is a sobering truth for us to remember as believers because we oftentimes can act in ways that are out of sorts with our nature in Christ. We also can fall into these patterns of being unloving, unfeeling, unhearing when the cries of the weak are extended. It's both a word of caution and a word of comfort for us as well. In many ways, reflecting on the song that we sang uh, before the time of the sermon, Jesus doesn't ever let us go. Jesus hears every single cry. There's a great philosophical question that's often posed in order to get students' brows to wrinkle. Some philosophers' ears must be burning tonight since I'm talking about philosophy so much tonight. It's just kind of the way it is, I guess. But you've heard the question, if a tree falls in the forest and there's nobody around to hear it, does it really make a sound? Now, I would say yes, probably, but there'd be a lot of people that would disagree with you about that and say, well, if nobody heard it, does it really produce any kind of sound? I had a friend in the classes whenever I was in high school who was a master at getting teachers off topic. In fact, I call my friend to mind everybody, every time somebody tries that in one of my classes. Uh, when I hear it coming, I can hear Shane's voice in my mind and say, oh, yeah, this guy's just trying to get us off topic. We'll answer that for a second or two, and then we'll get back to what we're talking about. In one particular math class, Shane said, uh, Miss Calvin, what do you think would happen if an irresistible force made contact with an immovable object? And she was very puzzled by that. She's like, I don't know. And she started putting these equations on the board. We were involved in that exercise for about 20 or 25 minutes or so. And she gets to the end and she turns around and she says, well, Shane, I'm not sure. The equation's not quite turning out. Uh, have you ever heard an answer to this? And he's like, no, I never have. But it sure would make one heck of a bang, wouldn't it? And everybody else is like, well... You know, well done, well played, sir. You've got us out of 25 minutes of class. Of course, we're also cheating ourselves of our education during that time. But, you know, we were too young to recognize that at the time. Education is the one place where people so often, sadly, don't mind not getting their money's worth. I've never quite understood that. They skip classes when they've paid for them and all that. But that's a topic for another day, I guess. If the tree falls in the forest, does anybody hear it? If someone cries out in this world, even the least of these, and nobody hears, does the person still cry out? And the answer here is yes, because whether any human being hears or not, there is one who hears. He testifies to it here in Matthew chapter 25. When the weak cry out in the midst of their oppression, there is one who hears. When the hungry cry out as their bellies are swollen, there is someone who hears. In the deepest darkness when you cry out, there is one who hears and one who cares as well. When injustice falls on your head and you see no way to the light, there is one who cares and one who wants to bring his comfort, grace, and mercy to you more than you could possibly imagine. That person is the Son of Man, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. This word is a word of comfort, but it's a word of caution as well. It's a word of caution because Jesus hears the cries of those that we oppress. Jesus hears the cries of those that we neglect. Jesus hears the cries of those that we sometimes in our hurry overlook. And as his sheep, it is our nature and it needs to be our priority as we go through life in such a hurry to take time to stop, to look, to listen, to hear, to feel. It is so easy to become jaded in this world, to become disconnected from what's happening in the lives of those around us, to see only our own fears and our own struggles, and not to see beyond that, to see the fears and struggles that others are dealing with as well. When I first got done with college, I 
got finished with classes, and I was supposed to get married at the end of that week. And we were actually serving in a small church, uh, about 45 minutes or so away from the college that I attended. My wife, or my future wife, went down to New Orleans to go ahead and get ready for our wedding preparations. And I was supposed to stay there for about four days, and I was going to go down and join her. Uh, Where we were at is a very rural area, even more so than Sioux Center. You may not believe that, but this was a very, very rural place. There were not many houses nearby at all. And about two nights after I got there, I had dinner with some friends, and then I drove back to the house where we were going to be living, and I could remember going inside and sitting there, and I was overcome by this intense feeling of loneliness. It was so deep and so powerful, it was overwhelming. And at first, all I thought about was that feeling. And there seemed something so odd about it, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. And after a few minutes, I started to realize why it was making such an impression on me. Not just because that was a pretty deep thing to feel in a place that was very lonely, very quiet, very dark at that moment. But it was impacting me even more because I realized that was the first thing I had really felt in months. It was the first thing that I had felt with that intensity and at that level in a long time. I had been so busy trying to get done with school, trying to take care of issues at work, trying to just do the business of living life, that I really had not experienced a deep, powerful, full emotion in probably weeks. I'm guessing a lot of you can identify with that. That there are times when you just stop and realize, I, in the midst of living my life, I don't know how much I've actually been living my life. And there are times when you stop and you look around and you suddenly realize, these people around me, they're dealing with this, they're dealing with that. You see people in a way that you often don't see people throughout the course of life. Because things can get so busy and we get so distracted. Here, Jesus is calling us to see and to love and to feel in the way that he sees and loves and feels. So it's a word of caution in the sense that we're reminded that we can be guilty of this too. The sheep are certainly not exempt from the goat-like behavior that Jesus is condemning here. He's calling us to be attached, to be present, to be really there in the lives of those around us as much as we are in our own lives. So it is a word of caution, but it is again a word of comfort as well. Because among those least, the very least of these, that includes us too. There's an old song that says, whosoever surely meaneth me. And if he loves even the least of these, that means he loves you. And that means that he loves me. And that means that our cries don't go unheard. Our pleas don't go unanswered. They may not be answered immediately. They may not be answered in exactly the way that we hope or the way that we plot out in our minds. But he cares. He answers. He moves in his own way, in his own time. He values us more than we could possibly imagine. So much so that whatever is done to us, he feels is like it's being done to him. When pain is inflicted on us, he feels that pain as intensely as if it's being meted out to him because in his eyes, it is. When we are needy and we are struggling, it is as if he is needy and he is struggling as well. He identifies with us so wholly, both first of all in his incarnation and in his humanity, But now, even as he walks beside us every single day as well, so completely, that what befalls us befalls him as well. The hands that hold us up are hands that we can trust because they're hands that are directed by a heart that loves us and values us more than we could possibly imagine. We're at the end of the year in regard to the Christian calendar, even though our calendar year, of course, in our culture has still got some time to go. But within a few weeks we are going to start celebrating Advent, the celebration of Christ's first coming. We are both the people of Advent, and we are also a people who look forward to his second coming, the one described here. As we prepare to ring out the Christian calendar, and we prepare to start celebrating his first coming, let us, as we look to his second coming, be a people 
in between both his first coming and his second, who are characterized by love, who are characterized by mercy. Let us, his sheep, live, love, and act as sheep should live, love, and act. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this evening you've given us to worship. We thank you for a gathered body of believers that you've given us to worship with. Thank you for all the ways that you equip us to minister to each other and all the gifts you give us to minister to a hurting world. We pray that you would display your glory and your grace through us each and every day. Give us an awareness of those who struggle alongside us. Enable us to use whatever resources, whatever influence we have, whatever means you have provided us to lift the burdens that others carry and to help them bear up under them. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for coming the first time. We thank you for assuming human flesh, for bleeding and dying on a cross and being gloriously resurrected so we could know you, to know your salvation and even the fellowship of your sufferings. And we pray that you would just give us the strength and grace to be faithful and continue to encourage our hearts with the reality that the day is coming when you will return in your glory and make all things new. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of response this evening is going to come from Psalter Hymnal number 601. Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love. pray with me. Our Father in heaven, creator and sustainer of all creation, omnipotent and providential God, you who are the almighty God and the loving shepherd, how dare we come into your presence? We come because you have called us. You have invited us. We know, Lord, that our sins are many, that the stain of sin covers us, we try to clean ourselves up, but it is only when we are washed in the blood of the Lamb, slain for our salvation, that we can approach your throne. We are grateful that you care for us, 
that you love us, that you watch over us. We thank you that you bind our wounds, that you cover our sins, that you hold us close to you. And with all our blessings, Lord, we still come to you this evening and ask for even more. We ask for healing for those who need your special touch, comfort for the sorrowing, unity for your people, that we may make a difference in this broken world. Encourage us and strengthen us so that we may reach out to those who so need to hear your name. Give us the insight that we may see beyond the glitz and glitter to the very core of those who deep inside are wounded and weary. Bless our lives and our work. Hold us close. Hold our loved ones close. And cover and over all, Lord, spread your peace. We ask this poor prayer only in your name, the name of our Savior and now our Lord, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our offering will be received now, and it is for the Lighthouse. Please rise and join me this evening in our statement of faith, which tonight is taken from Our World Belongs to God, paragraph 43. We grieve that the church, which shares one spirit, one faith, one hope, and spans all time, place, race, and language, has become a broken communion in a broken world. When we struggle for the purity of the church, and for the righteousness God demands, we pray for saintly courage. When our pride or blindness blocks the unity of God's household, we seek forgiveness. We marvel that the Lord gathers the broken pieces to do his work, and that he blesses us still with joy, new members, and surprising evidences of unity. We commit ourselves to seeking and expressing the oneness of all who follow Jesus. Our closing song tonight is going to come from the Psalter Hymnal, number 603. Lord, whose love and humble service. First we'll sing verses 1 through 3.
following the benediction, we'll sing verse 4. People of God, go in peace to love and serve the Lord, living lives that testify of his grace and mercy. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and always give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen.